thanks very much to, for inviting me. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, the book is, a, is, I trained as a psychiatric nurse. I started my training in 1980. And, um, and I really found that, I, I, that all of the sort of explanatory models weren't really sufficient for describing what I was experiencing in Springfield, where I trained. Um, on the wards with the patients, and uh, and I found my way to uh, uh, psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, and and then started to sort of pursue various different people in terms of supervision and psychoanalytic practice, because my sort of passion is the application of psychoanalytic ideas in psychiatric settings. Um, that what I'm going to read to you is not actually in the book, but it's really what the book is all about. Um, it's a sort of combination, my, my sort of belief that, first of all, if you're going to consult and supervise staff in frontline settings, um, you've got to know something about the clinical experience that the staff are up against. So for a long time, I've been part of the Fitzjohns service, which is the Tavistock Clinic, which is a service for people who wouldn't ordinarily be taken on in outpatient psychiatric, uh, psychotherapy settings. So I, I'm part of that unit, I see patients, and part, part of the book is about my clinical work with those patients and my attempts to sort of work with and understand those patients. And then part of it is about working with frontline psychiatric staff and applying some of the knowledge to, um, you know, to, to what they're up against, really. Um, I always think with mental health that... Um, uh, I think it's a sort of Tom Main quote. He said he realised in the Second World War. He said, "The further you were away from the front line, the braver you became." <laughs> so that when you're in the trenches, you haven't got a clue what's going on. There's confusion, chaos, and anxiety all around you. By the time you're in the general's hut, five yards, you know, five miles back, you know exactly what you should be doing, and um, everything's clear. And I think psychiatry is a little bit like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, 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 other, the other point that I just wanted to make is I've been privileged to have learned a lot from, from people who I think have really um, sort of had something to say about the application of psychoanalytic ideas in psychiatric settings. And so I, I've tried to, in a way, borrow a lot of, you know, what they've taught me um, and I've been fortunate to have some very good mentors. Um, so this is what the book's about. Okay. So this is a, a chapter called Supervision and Consultation, Tuning into Psychotic Communications in Frontline Mental Health Settings. So a valuable secondary benefit to actual clinical work that takes place on the Fitzjohns unit with disturbed patients who fluctuate between neurotic and psychotic states of mind is the provision of, learn, of a learning environment for other senior clinicians. Our ongoing clinical experience and struggle with such patients serves as a constant reminder of the difficulties and dilemmas inherent in all clinical work. Thus, the experience and insights gained from face-to-face -face work with troublesome patients can be called upon when staff from, the, from a unit offer supervision and consultation to mental health professionals and teams. Several members of the Fitzjohns unit have been involved in consultation and supervision of frontline mental health teams. The psychoanalytic thinking that is the bedrock of the Fitzjohns model is valuable for the light it can throw on bizarre symptoms and behaviour, destructive repetition, repetitious patterns of thought and action, and the problematic relationships between patients and teams trying to care for them in psychiatric settings. To be sure, patients who suffer from a serious and enduring mental illness often need psychological, chemical, and sometimes physical containment. The types of settings that provide these containment and the balance of interventions used will vary according to the patient and his or her level of disturbance at any given time. <coughs> However, <coughs> the diagnosis and active interventions employed by psychiatry must be accompanied by a receptive approach to treatment and care. 
Mental health professionals have to take an interest in the meaning of their patient's symptoms and their verbal and physical communications, which may convey important information about the patient's internal world and underlying conflicts. This receptive approach requires mental health professionals to have the capacity to make a switch from the active state of mind demanded by many psychiatric interventions to the receptive state of mind required by the need to take in the patient's emotional state. In the unit, we regard this as a naturally occurring process that takes place in the encounter between the patient and the professional. However, good mental health care and treatment also needs to go beyond this important first step by trying to understand the relationship between the patient's presentation and their personality. Indeed, highly disturbed patients need to be cared for by mental health professionals who are interested in and committed to understanding the meaning behind their presenting problem. Recovery will depend on the patient's ability to reclaim his or her capacity for psychological thought and insight. However, the development of insight can itself be a persecutory process as patients become aware of the fragmentation of their minds and their detachment from shared reality. Post-traumatic depression is a common symptom in patients in the process of recovering from a serious and enduring mental illness, as they often feel they're unable to face the full extent of their psychological difficulties. They may also worry they're unlovable, unbearable, untreatable, or damaging to others. They may, out of desperation, seek ideal or magical solutions to their problems, and this may in turn impede the recovery process, as the patient develops a psychic structure designed to avoid painful realities. John Steiner makes the point that these defensive organisations need to be respected and understood as they, they provide respite from demanding anxieties that have to do with fragmentation on the one hand and depression on the other. Consequently, it's the mental health professional who in the first instance has to develop and contain the insight into the nature of the patient's difficulties. Understanding the use of defences helps professionals to make sense of the patient's psychic structure. In addition to feeling feelings of anxiety, loss and despair, patients who become aware of the extent of their difficulties are also prone to feelings of humiliation. Indeed, the dependence upon professionals and the inevitable imbalance between themselves and the perceived authority can highlight patients' feelings of inferiority. <coughs> the fact that mental health professionals are required to assess the patient's mental state and functioning can also exacerbate feelings of being looked down on, judged or shamed. Professionals need to be sensitive to these feelings and, whenever possible, help support patients in managing them. If professionals act in ways which are insensitive to patients' shame and humiliation, it may exacerbate historical feelings of resentment and unfairness in relation to authority figures. If these issues are not understood, they can become the locus of a grievance between the patient and the professional. This undermines the therapeutic relationship, which is central to the process of recovery. However, even if professionals are sensitive to these issues, the sheer imbalance of power in the relationship can still inflame these dynamics. This becomes most evident when professionals are required to execute their professional roles and responsibilities. Um, in order to avoid the dynamics outlined above, professionals may find themselves adopting approaches that are affected by unconscious forces as they attempt to avoid any stance which differentiates them from the patient. This loss of differentiation and reluctance to take up a position of professional authority 
can lead to an erosion of professional practice. An example of this can be seen when the mental health clinician reassures the patient that their thinking is quite normal or nothing to worry about, even when patients say they're becoming unwell. The reassurance leaves responsibility for the problem wholly with the patient, um, with the part of the patient that's in touch with the extent of their difficulties. Numerous serious untoward incident investigations have highlighted services' failure to listen to patients who'd reported they were feeling unwell and in danger of harming themselves or others. Relatives have also often been ignored when they've recognised early signs of breakdown in the patient. Effective mental health work depends on the professional's willingness to allow themselves to be disturbed by the patient while still maintaining a professional, professionally balanced view. However, establishing a therapeutic relationship with patients is complex and may itself be prone to false alliances, deceptions and denial. These illusions and denials emanate sometimes from the patient, sometimes from the mental health professional, and sometimes from within the mental health system itself. The therapeutic relationship. Sorry, I've got a bit of a tickly throat. When things are going well, the professional takes in and empathises with his or her patient's situation while not becoming either overwhelmed or over-identified. Two responses that can lead to clinical difficulties. When the latter situation arises, the professional's anxiety may become abnormally high, leading to anti-therapeutic behaviour in the therapeutic relationship. On the one hand, the professional may attempt to cure the patient through her heroic efforts this is one of the dynamics that drives acts of professional misconduct, as an attempt to rescue the patient can lead to bre breaches in professional boundaries. On the other hand, the professional may attempt to distance him or herself from the patient, who's felt to be pervaded by damaged and damaging states of mind. When this happens, the professional may develop a hard external skin designed to keep the patient and his and her or her disturbance at a distance, giving the impression of cruel indifference. In order to develop and maintain a balanced approach, clinical staff will need settings and structures, and I would argue a model that helps them to digest the anxieties and pain involved in therapeutic work. Support needs to be provided through supervision, reflective practice and clinical discussion. These opportunities can help professionals, some professionals separate from their identification with the patient and restore an objective clinical approach, while others are helped to reflect on hardened attitudes in the interest of becoming more emotionally available. Psychoanalytic treatment is not widely available in the NHS, and although many patients with a severe and enduring mental illness or personality disorder may benefit from such treatment, it would not be the treatment of choice for all patients. Nevertheless, I would argue that an interest in the meaning of symptoms and behaviours should be seen as a cornerstone to all mental health treatment and care. Whether or not patients themselves are interested in the meaning of their symptoms, they do benefit from being treated by professionals who understand and are interested in their point of view. Psychoanalytic thinking and insights provide a model for taking account of unconscious forces that operate within therapeutic relationships, and thus for understanding the meaning of symptoms. Clinical discussion about the nature of relationships between staff and patients, including enactments, can throw light on the clinical problems underlining the patient's presentation and way of relating, as the following vignettes 
um, will we'll make clear. So differentiating between health and illness. A mental health volunteer presents the case of Mr. N, who had a history of homelessness. He described the man as a lost soul without personality or identity. He says, I go around to see him every week. Mr. N is completely isolated, rarely speaks, and spends his day staring at the wall. I think he's hearing or seeing things, as occasionally he responds to things going on in his mind by muttering or laughing to himself. He doesn't wash, and the flat is filthy. I've tried to get him assessed by various different services because I think he's ill, but everyone says there's nothing wrong with him. When they ask him about psychotic symptoms, he denies them, saying only that he has dreams in front of his eyes. On one occasion, out of desperation, I took a mental health professional around to Mr N's flat so that she could see the state of his home. He, the guy talking is a, is a non-qualified um, person. So she, she could see the state of his home. But Mr. N wouldn't open the door. The professional said Mr. N did not have, uh, have to let her in. This was his choice, and the visit was abandoned. Now we can see how Mr. N denies the nature of his psychotic illness by keeping it to himself. He normalises hallucinations by calling them dreams in front of his eyes. The negative effects of schizophrenia lead to him withdrawing from contact from the external world into a delusional world of his own creation. The patient's denial and rationalisation of his illness, combined with the pressure on the mental health system to restrict the numbers of people on their caseload, leads to a collusion between the mental health services and the patient. Professionals with serious and in, uh, patients with serious and enduring mental health illness need services and professionals who are able to listen, take in, and bear the pain of their psychological disturbance. However, the challenge for such professionals is to work out which part of the patient is talking and with what aim. Is it the healthy part that's in touch with psychic reality and the need for help, or the psychotic part employing denial and rationalisation to justify its argument and conceal the real goal of manic self-sufficiency? Or is it a perverse part which wishes to interfere with the establishment of a truthful picture, or an infantile part that wishes to maintain a position of complete dependence. Healthy aspects of the mind that contain awareness and insight can find themselves wrath, uh, wrestling with pathological or defensive elements of the mind in an ongoing dynamic struggle. Now the distinction between Ill illness and health is useful when determining whether the patient's disturbance has moved from something that convention would describe as within the normal range to something that would be deemed abnormal. This helps the psychiatrist to make decisions about the necessity for treatment, the degree of their responsibility for the patient, and also whether the severity of the condition warrants compulsory detention in order to care for them. The dividing line between illness and health provides the clarity necessary for making decisions about appropriate action. As necessary as it is, however, this sort of medical categorization doesn't provide a model for thinking about the dynamic interplay between different parts of the personality operating and influencing the patient's mind. In the example described above, mental health professionals listen to Mr. N's denial and rationalisation of his illness 
and decides he's well enough to make his own decisions. Leaving the patient untreated and the less experienced volunteer with the responsibility for a man who's out of touch with the level of his disturbance. Thus, professionals and patients alike avoid painful thinking about the patient and his mental state. Example two, denial and rationalisation. A community psychiatric nurse told a supervision group about a patient in a violent psychotic state who'd recently been admitted to the locked ward for the fourth time in as many years. The patient had been discharged from hospital six months earlier. He felt stigmatised by his psychiatric label and didn't like the side effects of the medication. Within five weeks, he persuaded the CPN to discharge him from follow-up, as he was better, apparently better. And soon after, he stopped taking his medication. Several months later, he was detained under mental health legislation and admitted to the locked psychiatric ward yet again because of violent behaviour. The patient also felt that ongoing contact with psychiatric services undermined his self-esteem and a view of himself as better and stronger. Discharging the patient also up opened up a space on the CPN's crowded caseload. The origins of this particular breakdown can be traced back to the moment when the patient persuaded the CPN that he was well enough to stop taking psychiatric fo- um, stop having psychiatric follow-up and discontinue his medication. The psychosis had by then already started to re-establish its hold within the patient's personality, as evidenced by his denial of any knowledge of his illness, or dependence upon service, or the likely outcome of these developments and actions. Professionals obviously have to listen to patients and consider their views, but the latter can express unrealistic demands based on a wish to deny painful realities, rather than just listening to these wishes and attempting to understand the patient's conflict and painful psychological state. The mental health system sometimes colludes by responding concretely. The capacity to depend depend upon others, which includes an awareness of limitations, is an important part of any patient's treatment, care, and potential for recovery. When patients reject the opportunity to form a helpful dependence, they may be forced back into the grip of more psychotic parts of their personality. This can increase risk and a danger of relapse as their underlying pathology goes unrecognised. Patients wish to return to a self-sufficient state of mind that denies underlying difficulties in an attempt to get away from the reality of their dependence, may be understandable, as dependence makes them feel small, damaged or humiliated. (coughs) However, discharge from services may leave patients deprived of the proper psychiatric help, which they find themselves at the mercy of psychotic aspects of themselves. Clinicians need a model for trying to take in and understand their patients' communication and suffering. Good uh, practice depends on the practitioner's ability to use themselves and their experience as a clinical tool. A psychoanalytic approach provides a model of the mind that allows for understanding both conscious and unconscious communication. It also provides a way of thinking about the relationship between the patient's internal and external world as expressed through the transference and counter-transference. For a psychoanalytic perspective, from a psychoanalytic perspective, when psychotic anxiety threatens to overwhelm the individual's ego, there's a collapse in the ego's capacity to manage the relationship between internal and external reality. Anxiety about the extent of damage to their mind, both internally in fantasy and externally in reality, can overwhelm the patient with despair. This can lead to them resorting to manic defences, 
based on magical thinking in order to deny underlying feelings of guilt and impotence. Psychotic elements of the mind can promote unrealistic, om omnipotent ideas of cure and self-sufficiency, while parts of the self that acknowledge the need for healthy dependency are attacked and undermined. Patients in manic states often believe they can deal with their underlying anxieties about uh, damage by dam magical means. Um, uh, yeah. Um, this includes putting psychic or, or physical distance between themselves and the problem, as if difficulties could be located in a particular geographical area and then left behind. In practical terms, this can lead to absconding, planning an unrealistic journey, uh, a change of job or partner. The problem with these mechanisms is that eventually the defence can no longer be maintained and they break down. In an attempt to regain control of these chaotic situations, some individuals may take drastic action or psychological action. Patients may, for example, act out violently in order to expel the overwhelming external, internal state, thereby forcing others to take control of their lives. Others whose minds fragment into psychotic states develop delusional systems in an attempt to gather the mind and, together and provide coherence and continuity in the ego. The delusional system binds the fragmented parts of the mind together into a coherent belief system created by the patient. A belief system that's based, however, on a psychic structure that bears no obvious relation to external reality. Uh, last case example. A psychiatric nurse and a mental health team presents the case of Miss F., who suffered, who was known to suffer from serious anorexia. And just remember, anorexia is the biggest um, uh, killer, basically, in psychiatry. St still is. No, I mean, a lot of people recover. But, um, you know, it's a, it's a high percentage of people who don't recover. <coughs> and she'd locked herself in her flat in order to starve herself. She had a habit of hoarding rubbish until it became a health hazard and posed a threat to other residents, whereupon the environmental health officer had to be alerted. So Miss F telephones the nurse and said that she felt suicidal and wanted to die. In fact, she said, I'm starving myself. The nurse visited the patient at home, but Miss F refused to open the door. So the nurse had to conduct a constrained and restrained interview with the patient through the letterbox. The nurse said she was worried about her because she received her um, message that she was killing herself and she wanted to talk to her GP to uh, organise a domiciliary visit. However, Miss F threatened to take legal action against the nurse if she con contacted the GP. A solicitor then phoned the CPN to complain about her attempt to speak to the patient through the letterbox, saying that she was going to take out a charge of harassment against the nurse who was interfering with the patient's human rights. <laughs> Several days later, the nurse received a letter from Miss F's solicitor confirming this threat and warning that she couldn't make touch with the GP un under any circumstances. The CPN felt utterly helpless. That she was losing her mind, as on the one hand, she had a duty of care and Miss F was clearly ill, while on the other, she was in danger of litigation and prosecution if she, if she took what she considered to be the appropriate action. Now, Bion describes a division in the patient's mind between the psychotic and the non-psychotic part of the personality. The psychotic part of the mind hates all emotional contact, psychic pain and meaning. This part of the mind uses violent projection 
in order to rid any awareness of painful conflicts or emotions. The non-psychotic part has the job of thinking about neurotic problems and conflicts in association with emotional pain and meaning. The patient's mind may alternate between these two states in what Bion described as a, the conflict with never decided between the life and death instinct. When the psychotic part of the mind is in the ascendancy, it may fragment and project the non-psychotic part in order to undermine its capacity to think in relation to reality. The vacuum left in the ego is then filled with magical th thinking based on omnipotence and omniscience rather than on reality testing. In the case of Miss F, we can see how the same part of the mind was being held hostage by the psychotic part. Although the same part of Mr. Miss F made fleeting, limited contact with the nurse in the initial phone call, making her aware of her predicament and expression, expressing her suicidal feeling, the psychotic murderous part then stepped in and attacked the contact. This was done by threatening the nurse with accusations of professional misconduct if she went against her wishes. The solicitor also had been coerced by the propaganda emanating from the psychotic part of the patient, designed to undermine the nurse's role and authority. Of course, Miss F's sane awareness still relied upon the nurse's resilience and capacity to hold on to the bigger clinical picture. And indeed, the nurse's gut reaction was to realise that the threats were part of the patient's illness and that the same part of Miss F's personality had been taken hostage by the psychotic part. Miss F's behaviour left, left the nurse feeling trapped in the horns of a dilemma. If she did nothing, her patient's condition um, would deteriorate further. If she acted, she'd be accused of abusing Miss F's human rights. This feeling of being trapped gave the nurse an experience of what it must be like to live in Miss F's shoes when the same part of the mind is being undermined and weakened by attacks and accusations from the psychotic part for drawing attention to the extent of the illness. We can see how Miss F's mental state fluctuates as the dynamics of her internal world changed. At one stage, the non-psychotic part of her mind became aware she's trapped inside a murderous psychotic state that wants to starve her to death. This same part of her mind was then able to let the nurse know she was afraid of being in its grip. However, once Miss F had made the nurse aware of the precarious state, she withdraws into the psychotic internal structure, denying there's a problem. This psychotic structure then insists that Miss F attack and undermines the helpful contact with the nurse. This psychotic attacks the relationship with the nurse. In discussion, the nurse said she felt intimidated by Miss F's that threat of legal action. On the one hand, she knew she couldn't leave the patient on, the other, on her own. Um, the nurse said she found that discussion helpful as it enabled her to think clinically about the situation. She also realised she needed the consultant psychiatrist's support in standing up to the intimidation from the psychotic part of the patient. The nurse subsequently reported she organised a domiciliary visit with the consultant who told Miss F that unless they were allowed to examine her and she complied to some extent, he would be forced to request a Mental Health Act assessment. The patient agreed to comply and the need to this, uh, a section the patient was avoided. Thus, the consultation and supervision provided support for the nurse in her difficult work with the patient by enabling a space for thinking about the underlying psychotic process. Together, we were able to consider the meaning of this anxiety-provoking and frustrating situation. 
Once we could think of the fluctuations between the psychotic and non-psychotic part of the personality, it was possible to understand the perplexing clinical picture. The supervision group was able to help the nurse separate from the tyrannical influence of Miss F's psychosis. Um, the restored relationship between the nurse and the psychiatrist formed an authority, because I was puzzled as to why the psychiatrist wasn't involved. Um, now we've got an uh, authoritative couple that were better able to withstand the threats and projections. Investigation of the patient's mind is an important part of good mental health practice, and mental health professionals need the authority and skill to carry out this task in a humane way. The nature of the psychosis is such that distractive aspects of the personality which hate any acknowledgement of need may attack and undermine the patient's sanity or the mental health professional's attempt to help. From time to time, of, cor of course, the non-psychotic part of the patient's mind may be completely overwhelmed by the psychosis in a way that forces them to act out the destructiveness physically, resulting in either a threat to themselves or others. When this happens, they may have to be taken under the care of the Mental Health Act. Um, these interventions are not a substitute for psychological care, but they may be necessary to safely care for the patient. What all three of the above cases suggest is that an important part of the patient's recovery is based on the capacity to mourn the loss of the ideal self and face uh, painful realities. Richard Lucas used to say, you know, let's face it, you get to a certain age, you realise we're all making the best of a bad job. <laughs> That's so true. This involves taking back aspects of the self that have been denied, split off and projected. There are inevitable cycles in this recovery as the picture moves between periods of development, mental integration and periods of disintegration and regression. This is a precarious process and may lead to feelings of guilt and despair followed by fragmentation or a retreat into paranoia which acts as a defence against depressive feelings about damage that may have been perpetrated. The mental health system's got to contain and care for patients with profound psychological difficulties and fragile egos that are prone to fragmentation in the face of painful psychological anxieties and conflicts. Their minds may also be inhabited by destructive aspects of the personality that offer psychotic solutions to problems in order to avoid rather than experience and bear painful psychic realities. These various elements wrestle for control over the mind um, as the patient's functioning veers between psychotic and non-psychotic components. Patients who suffer from a psychotic illness or personality disorder find it hard to face the extent of their difficulties and suffering and may withdraw from the world, world of shared emotional meaning into preoccupations with states of mind based on omnipotence. Ordinary communication may be stripped of its symbolic value and any capacity to convey emotional significance creates a gulf that leaves mental health professionals and relatives feeling alienated and deprived of meaningful contact. Um, you know, Beale makes the point that, that concrete thinking is, is, is concrete because the, the, the emotional resonance that we usually look for in symbolic communication has been squeezed out of it. Um, and uh, and the usual transaction. I mean, I was thinking about this the other day. You know, the, I mean, the mobile phone companies and social media—they all make a fortune because we're all we're built to talk to one another, to to have meaningful interactions. But the psychosis wants to sort of reduce this to sort of very mechanistic type of communication. Um, hence, you get a sort of um, you get this concrete thinking. 
Um, the danger is that mental health professionals can respond to such attacks on psychological meaning by becoming mechanistic in their thinking, leaving patients feeling they're dealt with by professionals who keep the patient and their suffering at too great a distance. Professionals may unconsciously go along with the patient's denial and rationalisation by trying to understand them at a neurotic level and joining with them in a manic denial of, of serious problems. This may alleviate painful realities about the extent of the patient's damaged thinking, but the patient's sane part is then left to manage the psychotic part alone without the necessary psychological support. Alternatively, mental health professionals may try to crush the psychosis by attacking it aggressively with doses of medication designed to eradicate psychotic symptoms. Now, th I'm not against antipsychotic medication at all. And um, I have a few patients that I see who've got a diagnosis of schizophrenia um, psychoanalytically, sometimes successful, not sometimes not so successful. But I would always insist that they have a relationship with their psychiatric service as a condition of treatment. I'd never take patients on. In um, either at the Tavistock or anywhere else without a relationship with the psychiatric service. I think it's antipsychotic medication is very important. But we tend to, psychiatry, my view is that psychiatry in this country tends to idealise medication. You know, and, and there's a wish to sort of crush the psychosis, hence leaving no room for madness in mental health. Um, Sorry, I've lost myself. Um, uh, yeah, they tr crush the psychosis by attacking it with aggressive doses of medication designed to eradicate psychotic signs and symptoms. However, even though psychotic states of mind are serious and may cause considerable suffering and pain to the patient and their relatives, the psychosis can't be eradicated completely as it represents an aspect of the patient's mind. This is not to say that psychosis and its side effects shouldn't be treated medically, but the danger is that rather that we may further persecute the patient if we give the impression that aspects of their mind are intolerable. The psychotic part of the personality may be destructive, but it also needs to be thought about and accounted for. Mental health professionals need to try and tune in to the psychotic wavelength in order to support their patients' struggle with the psychotic aspects of themselves. And, of course, I'm talking about borderline and personality disorder patients who've got sort of psychotic areas of functioning but may not be thought of psych psychiatrically as psychotic. Even patients diagnosed as suffering from a neurotic conditional personality disorder who may not obviously be out of touch with reality can demonstrate evidence of what psychotherapists may describe as psychotic thinking. They're not necessarily psychotic from the psycho psychiatric point of view. These manifestations may nevertheless be based on omnipotent and omniscient ways of thinking. Acutely disturbed individuals require mental health services to take action and intervene actively in their lives, sometimes against their will. This is an important part of, uh, of psychiatry and psychiatric practice, and a reluctance to act may be unhelpful. However, mental health services also need to take in and think about the meaning of their patient's symptoms, behaviours and actions. As I have argued throughout this chapter, it's the abs absence of an adequate model for thinking about the effects of psychotic communication that can leave professionals in danger of reacting to unconscious forces without understanding them. So in conclusion, <coughs> and apologies for those who aren't um, in touch with the psychiatric, um, what's going on in psychiatry at the moment, but it's in a pretty parlant, it's in a bad way. Over recent years, in my opinion. Over recent years, funding for mental health services in the UK has been consistently cut more drastically than for acute medicine, although they keep talking about parity of esteem, drives me mad. Um, the, the, the reason is that they, they, put, they pour money into the, into the 
into the system, but the, the overspend in the acute hospitals is so big, the money just goes into paying off their deficits, and so it doesn't find its way to psychiatry. These financial cuts have driven commissioners to push for redu reductions in staffing levels, grades of staff, closure of beds, and short-term treatment. The shortage of resources can encourage the deployment of manic defences in the mental health system. Treatment length is increasingly based on limited resources rather than clinical evidence. In spite and in, spite, and in the face of these fiscal and political developments, I would still contend that each patient state should, as far as possible, be seen and understood within the context of their overall development and history. In other words, no matter how short the episode might be, we're not trying to keep people in psychiatric settings, but one takes a sort of long-term view. Um, mental health professionals need to try and take a long-term view of their patients, including the fact they move, may move in and out of illness over long periods of time. Managers and commissioners need to be helped to understand that mental illness is damaging and serious and at times dangerous and unpredictable. And so usually it can't be managed on a short-term uh, episodic basis. In the attempt to reduce costs and squeeze on the time available for teaching, supervision, um, a supervision and case discussion, undermines the reflective capacity of individuals and teams, thus weakening the structures that support staff's capacity to digest clinical experiences. So they've done things like um, they've reduced the handover time between nursing shifts, which is the time when uh, you'd have teaching and supervision and one thing or another. All that's been squeezed. This is a, these are generalisations, but there's, there's a lot of truth in them. You can find exceptions, but... There's a danger of creating, in the place of these structures, a system that increases the distance between the patient's suffering and the mental health services. So my point is, if you don't support the staff in, in helping them digest the sort of emotional um, sort of, you know, currency that's involved in mental health, then in a way, inevitably, people cut off because they just feel too overwhelmed. It's in the light of these worrying developments that clinicians and the Fitzjohns unit do their utmost to maintain the intimate connection and complementarity between the treatment of patients with severe and enduring personality disorder and, front, and supervision of frontline staff. On the one hand, the experience of once or twice weekly work with ill patients in the psychoanalytic psychotherapy gives clinicians first-hand experience of the emotional field involved in the treatment of such patients. The ongoing clinical struggle keeps therapists alert to general difficulties of the work, and this in turn helps supervisors stay in touch with the limitations of understanding. One mustn't be omnipotent about psychoanalytic understanding in psychiatric settings. You'll, you'll, you'll quickly come unstuck. <laughs> As someone picks up a chair, is about to throw it at you, and you start making an interpretation, which is liable to you end up being crashed over there with the chair. On the other hand, examples like those above of psychiatric patients in the acute stage of illness can keep therapists in contact with severe psychopathology on the mental health front line. Such mutuality is crucial. We believe that this model is particularly helpful when thinking about psychotic or borderline functioning because it can restore the missing emotional meaning uh, in concrete communication or acting out. It can improve clinicians' capacity to remain interested in their patient's emotional life and enable the clinician to listen out for rare moments of meaning even when the predominance or pre prevailing discourse to be, seems to be utterly stripped of meaning. Um, so you get these moments when even patients in very bizarre, quite cut off states of the, listening to the patient, you, you know, it really sort of gives you a headache. But then you get moments of contact and you can miss those if you've sort of, if you're overwhelmed by the more bizarre 
um, which also needs thinking about, but is not available in the same sort of way. Um, patients who act out their disturbance in dramatic ways also project into their bodies or develop sadomasochistic relationships with others, sometimes with their clinical teams. Um, they need mental health staff to be interested in understanding them. This doesn't necessarily mean that the patient either wants or can manage insight while they're acutely ill. So this is another important point, that, that no matter how disturbed the patient is, they want to be with people who understand them. You know, when you admit a patient under section, a number of times, even they're fighting the section and then they calm down once they've been sectioned, the relief when they meet a nurse who they remember from their last admission is palpable. And, and when you get continuity of care, you can really see that. They go, oh, I remember you from last time. It doesn't mean that they want insight into their current state. It's a different matter. But they do want to be with people who understand how they're feeling. Um, John Steiner points out the two stages of our work. You know, one is to be to, to feel with, with someone who cares and understands. The second is taking in insight. As the Fitzjohns therapists know, insight into the nature of the patient's difficulties has to be understood and worked through by the therapists themselves before it can be interpreted to the patient. This is particularly important when treating patients who are not able to bear psychological pain involved until, it's, uh, until there's a feeling that they've secured the understanding and support of their therapist. I'm often struck actually by how much, you know, the clinical picture is often changed by some understanding in the therapist first in the counter-transference, you know, before you can sort of, um, to give a piece of understanding back to the patient anyway. Um, ill patients can have a considerable effect on therapists by provoking them into acting out. And these enactments need to be processed by the therapist before underlying issues can be worked through in the therapeutic relationship. Working with people with mental illness can be rewarding and enlightening but it's also frightening, boring, frustrating, anxiety-provoking and stupefying. Um, there's a real problem with uh, vacancies for consultant psychiatric posts. Because of, and I think, I think one of the reasons is that they, they're quite daunting. There's a lot of responsibility on, um, for risk that, that, that uh, resides with the psychiatrists. Um, at the moment and in our rather persecutory environment about blame um, people are reluctant to, take, reluctant to take on consultant positions patients communications and actions can have a disturbing effect on the mental health professional and can provoke them into reacting um, reactions that try to control the patient's thinking or behaviour and whilst that's appropriate sometimes it can sometimes be over determined Sometimes one's got a section, the patient, etc., but sometimes one looks to um, control the patient above and beyond what's necessary. Although at times actions taken by staff are appropriate and necessary, they may also be driven by a wish to cur curtail provocative or disturbing elements. Ultimately, it's incumbent upon staff and patients to try and understand the disruptive and destructive elements of the patient's thinking. Without this deeper understanding, um, opportunities will be missed. So my point is, you know, it's difficult, you know, when, you know, you're, you're in the, you know, there's a, a violent piece of acting out. One wouldn't expect you to a patient who's sort of throwing the TV around the, you know, the, the, the day room or you're a CPN. I want once a patient said, look, if this consultation doesn't go well, she put a scalpel down on the table. She said, one of us is going to get stabbed by that. I mean, it's very hard to think <laughs> when you're feared, you're afraid of getting stabbed or hit, being hit by the TV. So I'm not sort of idealising understanding, but one can sometimes sort of on reflection think about things. And at the time, the appropriate thing is, is what, what am I going to do? You know, everyone's got to think about the action, but it's, it's sort of um, on reflection, really. Um, yes. 
Ultimately, is it, yeah, with, without this deepening understanding, opportunities for understanding will be lost. Psychoanalysis offers a model for thinking about and providing meaning for anxiety that drives us out of our minds. And this can reduce the risk of thoughtless action. Finally, in order for this receptive capacity to be sustained in the minds of staff, they need to feel they're being looked after by senior management that take their concerns and feelings seriously and understand really that they're not living in a perfect world. All, psychiatric staff are always pressed by sort of dilemmas about what to do, when to act, when not to act, um, that, that often don't come across when you know, they're being disciplined for some sort of breach or whatever. Um, yeah. Finally, in order f uh, for this... Uh, uh, th th yeah, yeah, staff need to be f um, feel they're being looked after and understand by management who are not sort of too ready to sort of police them. One of the things that I find is, is that the morale of the staff is one of the most important guides to sort of therapeutic effectiveness in psychiatric settings. You look after the staff, they tend to look after the patients by rule of thumb. Um, it's with all this in mind that the Fitzjohn's unit with its psychoanalytic model offers and provides mental health professionals, both its own and those who work with others in other settings, with a way of thinking about patients that is aimed to help them make sense of their experience. It also provides a language for describing psychological interactions that takes place within the therapeutic relationship and for articulating the experiences with patients in a thoughtful and considered way. Mm -hmm. It helps professionals to see a different dimension of the patient through the transference and counter-transference. Um, oh, I'm going to skip some of this. Yeah. Do we, do we, do we? Yeah, okay. okay. Um, wrap yeah, I'll wrap it up. Um, so really, as, as, as I've said, I think that um, I don't want to get into a sort of idealisation of psychoanalysis either because, you know, you're very grateful to this when you work with patients who are very disturbed um, and you're carrying the anxiety of, as, um, of a patient you think is going to kill themselves Im imminently or kill somebody else or one thing or another. It's, you know, to, to, to be able to phone a psychiatric colleague... Um, who's receptive to your anxieties and says, OK, I'll go around and I'll see what I can make of them. It's enormously important. Um, and, uh, and psychiatric colleagues are under, uh, under enormous pressure, as, uh, as I've said at the moment. But you do find people, despite the, almost despite the system, um, what I'm always impressed by is that good psychiatric work goes on you know people go into psychiatry by and large because they're interested in their patients and they they sort of they're, they're, they're curious about themselves and their patients and they they um you know they want to help so so um um although the system has become more persecutory and fragmented you know there's a lot of good ordinary work that goes on um but I do think, and that's what I'm passionate about in terms of the book, that, that psychoanalytic thinking has got a lot to offer um, and, and provides a way of um, helping staff think about really sort of bizarre, um, complicated sort of behaviours, which, which, you know, can really sort of do your head in. Um, Sometimes on a, it's a long time since I worked on an inpatient unit. 1984 is the last time I gave a patient an injection. It's a million years ago. But you sometimes come off the ward, you just got a headache, just with having your sort of head banged in. But anyway, there we are. That's it. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you.